thank you to our second round table of the fall 2009 semester. I'm very delighted that all of you came, and I'm very delighted to have a very knowledgeable uh, and well-rounded panel. As you know, our topic this evening is miscommunicating about the financial meltdown, question mark, so we'll talk about that tonight. Um, I'd like to begin with an introduction to our panel, but first I'd like to let you know that this uh, panel discussion is co-sponsored by our MA in Applied Economics program and our MA in Communication program. Both programs offer uh, master's degrees for working professionals. We have classes in the evening, so if you're thinking about either a master's in communication or a master's in applied economics, we do have information about those programs. We have a whole booklet about it uh, right over here, and then outside we have little sheets of information if you'll be interested. Um, I'd like to start on my immediate left with David Arsenault. Did I get that correct, David? David is an economist in the Division of International Finance at the Federal Reserve Board. His research interests include monetary economics and macroeconomics, in particular the implications of real, real rigidities and optimal monetary and fiscal poli policy prescriptions, and you can ask him what that means, okay? <laughs> he received his PhD from the University of Virginia. Immediately to David's left is Neil Irwin. Neil is the National e Economy Reporter, or Economy Correspondent, for the Washington Post. He has been one of the uh, paper's lead reporters covering the 2007 to 2009 recession, long before some of us even knew it was a recession. Uh, he covers financial crisis and, and the response of the Federal Reserve. Um, he's been at the Post since 2000, and in that time span he's also he's covered the Washington area, regional economy, commercial real estate, which I'm sure is very interesting, and internet companies. Um, and then to uh, Neil's immediate left is Sadiq Reddy. Okay. Sadiq is a staff reporter at the Wall Street Journal, and he covers the U.S. economy and the Federal Reserve. He joined the journal in 2007 after six years at the Dallas Morning News, and at the news he was the Washington correspondent covering the intersection of business and politics. Um, and he also has won awards for his business reporting, uh, the best deadline writing in Texas for stories related to Hurricane Katrina. So we're also very happy to have him. My, my first name is Kazanpik, so I have trouble. <laughs> okay. um, he's a senior economist at Fannie Mae. He's responsible for economic modeling for mortgage, mortgage and loan servicing. And he was the lead developer in providing corporate-wide loss estimates resulting from the Hurricane Katrina and Hurricane Rita situations. The first thing I'd like to start with is to ask everyone, um, everyone wants to know how things could have gotten so bad so fast. Uh, and so, it, is this really true? Did things get this bad so fast, or were, was the public just not paying attention? Um, did the financial meltdown happen as quickly as it seemed? Because it seemed one Monday morning you went to bed, and the next Monday morning you had no 401k. I was kind of curious what, uh, we can start maybe with Ed and, and David first. Okay, I'm, <laughs> I'm gonna speak from a very narrow perspective. I'm gonna talk from the perspective uh, as uh, of a housing economist who works in the financial industry. Um, I guess David will give more of the perspective of the macroeconomy. So it was a long time in coming. Um, nothing happens overnight. Um, I, I'm going to you know, take it back a few years. Um, I think one of the things we've got to think about, especially this season, you know, we're going to see um, we're going to see It's a Wonderful Life on TV, and we're going to see the, the mortgage, you know, the, the, the loan officer sitting opposite the, the client. That doesn't happen, and that hasn't happened for many years. Um, Fannie Mae has over 18 million loans on its book, and we get these loans in mainly through an underwriting system called DU, Desktop Underwriter. It's a model, and this is, this is again, this is important. We're all economists or, or communications. Uh, so models are communicated out, <laughs> and people have a tremendous reliance on models. And perhaps desktop underwriter is very successful. We're getting a lot of good people, you know, into the mortgage, into the mortgage, uh, into mortgages, into homes. And perhaps it's excluding people who aren't so good. But of course, there's humans behind it. Um, so the transition has been happening a long time. There's a reliance on models, perhaps an over reliance on models. And what what also came at the forefront, um, and this happened again in the 90s, even um, when I was back in graduate school in the mid-90s, um, the school set up um, an MA in financial math. And it was a joint program between the math department and, the, and the, the statistics department. And most of the people who did that were PhDs in physics, PhDs in math, who couldn't find jobs in their fields. And these people went out to Wall Street. And you got a culture where you had the suits 
And this, is, this was taken from um, some testimony on the hill, um, where somebody from Freddie Mac, our cousins across the river as we call them, somebody gave a testimony, it was the suits versus the geeks. And the geeks were building these models and the suits didn't understand these models. And now I really question whether the, the uh, geeks actually understood the models either. But because people didn't understand, but they were making money in the good times, these models, of course, were propagated. There were some major hiccups along the way. I mean, we all, you know, we can all think about uh, long-term capital. There's an excellent book by Roger Lowenstein, who is from Wall Street Journal. No? Oh, <laughs> got that one wrong. But anyway, as a, an example, there's an excellent book um, on the whole debacle there, um, what happened. And there's been other debacles along the way. But, you know, think times were good. Things went on. Now, I'd say what really happened in the mortgage industry um, was, was it was government policy and people and government policy way back when said, you know, we can get more people in homes. There's a big divide between um, white home ownership and minority home ownership. So they wanted to put more people in the home in homes. So they were going to push, they were going to allow a lot of subprime mortgages to go through. You had a situation where there was a lot of excess cash in the world. You had, you know, excess, um, uh, you had surpluses from, you know, exports to the U.S. in the Far East. You had oil money in the Middle East. These people had money. They, they needed somewhere to park their money. So after the, you know, after the tech bubble burst, um, perhaps it was an opportunity for the government to get them to, you know, to push policies to allow these subprime mortgages. And I, I use the word allow because, you know, everyone says there's no regulation. Um, there was regulation, but I think it was a part, it was a was policy at, at a certain level, they wanted to push these. I went to hear an extremely um, interesting sp uh, speaker, a guy called Ed Gramlich, who unfortunately passed away. And, and his, his, um, his book and his, his speech was basically, we thought back, you know, before the subprime, you know, before the subprime thing blew up, that we could, ex we could bring um, African-American home ownership from, you know, 55% up to 70%, and it would be acceptable if a quarter of those people were to lose their homes, you know, at the end of the process. It was a policy decision, and, you know, looking back at the time, perhaps it was a very fair policy decision. But what happened was, okay, you come, you start building models, who should get the mortgages, who shouldn't, who shouldn't get the mortgages, and I have to relate it to what I teach in class, so there's, there's a very popular model they, used to, they like to use in these, in these, um, in these industries, the logic model which tries to separate between good and bad. You know, good mortgages, people are going to keep on paying, bad mortgages, people default, okay? And they started building models where they would, you know, put people with a seven, tw uh, sorry, with a 520 FICO and a 560 FICOs, both really bad FICOs, and you're going to try and build a model to separate between them. Well, the truth is you can't really separate between bad and bad. You can get slight separation. You're not going to get in the terms, you know, you're not going to get a good fit but these models were pushed up to the suits. They took them as, as you know, divine, um, divine models. We must use them. And a lot of bad people were put in homes. So I would say, um, I've probably been speaking for long enough, so I would say that, you know, it was a long time in coming. And, you know, when something bad happens, you know, and there's a lot of, there's a lot of, there's a lot of weak, the foundation is weak, it doesn't take much of a storm to knock the building down. And, you know, everyone thought it happened when the building was knocked down, but the foundation was very weak to begin with. I just wanted to add, I meant to say this before David and, and Ed started speaking. David and Ed are here, but they're expressing their own views. They're not expressing the views of any government agency while they're here. So I did, May. Yeah, or <laughs> Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac or the Federal Reserve. So I just wanted to point that out. I forgot to mention that at first. Okay, David, did you have anything to add? Yeah, I'll add a couple words to that. I, I think I'll say explicitly that, that my views are my own. They're not the, uh, the views of the Board of Governors or the Federal Reserve System in general. Um, so I'll just get that out there uh, for my, my own mouth for myself. <laughs> Um, I, I think that, uh, you know, to, to sort of cut straight to, to the question itself is, you know, uh, did this really happen as quickly as, uh, as it seemed? I, I think that the answer, in, in my mind, is, is yes, beyond a doubt. Yes, it did happen very quickly, surprisingly uh, quickly. Um, I think that one of the reasons why, uh, you know, this crisis, this particular financial crisis sort of happened so rapidly is, is uh, you know, it has to relate 
to the fact that that uh, this is a, a unique event. I mean, this is an event that that you know has happened one other time. Well, not even in this decade. One other time in the last hundred years. I mean. Uh, we're dealing with a, a credit crisis that's on the order of, of what happened during the Great Depression. Um, the, I think the, U the, the U.S. economy and the world economy in general ha has really not experienced this much of a disruption to credit markets in a long, long time. Uh, and I think that that, that came as, as a big surprise. I think that it may have been the case that, that you know, the, the correction in the housing market was a long time coming. That, that may be very well be true. But uh, going beyond that, I think the spillover beyond the housing market into other asset markets, what it did to lending in general, what it did to the availability of credit in the macro economy, uh, and, and from the credit crunch, what then spilled over into the real side of the economy, not only in the U.S., but, but, but globally, uh, you know, is, it's, it's unique. It's unique both in, its, in, the, in, the, in, the, in the magnitude of the crisis and the speed of the crisis. Uh, so to answer the question, yes, it was, in my view, pretty rapidly. I'd be happy to talk more about, uh, you know, sort of the, the, the setup of the stage, you know, what caused the crisis and, uh, you know, essentially a financial panic. And I think that the, the panic aspect of this crisis, I think, is really what, 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 what caused this to onset so rapidly. But maybe some of these... Uh, some, well, some actually, we're going like to we're gonna talk about the panic and the onset. But I did want um, Sadiq and Neil to, to weigh in on this, because I, I think some of us are, are asking, did the press know about this? And if they knew about it, then why didn't the public know about it? And, and if this modeling had been taking place for a long time, then was it just that it was so complicated that people couldn't report it, or there was so much else going on that it wasn't on the agenda? So from a reporter's perspective, you know, how do you view the crisis? When, when did it really become a matter of great interest? Interest to the media and become, you know, the top story. I can, uh, let me let me key real quick onto something uh, David said. Uh, you know, housing prices topped out. Uh, I believe the first half of 2006, which is you know almost four years ago. Um, for you know, housing prices started declining. The housing correction started and was going on for for basically uh, two years before we hit a recession. And then even that, even then, once we were in recession, the beginning of that recession was not too severe. The last year, 2008, until you got to about August, September, it was a run-of-the-mill recession. Job losses were, you know, not great, but, uh, but, but not even a very deep recession, fairly mild. We hit this inflection point in September 2008 when, when the entire world fell apart and everybody got bailed out and a lot of nasty stuff happened. And that's when the, the macroeconomic situation just, just went off a cliff and, and really got nasty. Um, as to what we reporters either did or didn't do or should have done and should have seen to uh, see these things coming, uh, you know, we, I think everybody's kind of doing an after action report. Everybody, whether you're a bank regulator or a, or a policymaker or a, or a reporter, you have to think, you know, what did I miss? What should I have known? What should I, what should I have seen? Um, I, I think to our credit, that if you do look back, there were some warning signs in different media. There were uh, you know, there were a lot of stories. I started writing stories in 2003, pondering whether there was a housing bubble or not. There were people who wrote about, uh, you know, unregulated derivatives markets in, uh, on Wall Street and CDOs and how, uh, how is all this extension of credit really going to end well. Um, there were people, you know, there were people on the ground level saying, look at all this bad lending happening in this particular market or this particular city. Um, what you didn't find was too many people who were able to connect all those dots and understand how all those things could combine. Rising home prices, uh, massive extension of credit on Wall Street, some bad lending practices, uh, among other huge forces to, to cause, uh, to cause the, the deep recession that we're in. Um, we missed that. Uh, I think most of the press missed the way these things were intertwined. Most policymakers missed this. And uh, I think the lesson is that we all need to think more broadly about how these different parts of the, of the picture fit together. To say that we should have seen it coming is, is probably clear now. To say that uh, looking at the facts at the time, though, that, that it was clear is a lot harder to, to put together. There were probably a handful of people who we would consider respectable economists who put the pieces together and highlighted that a big wave of uh, bad mortgages are going to hit banks and it's going to create create a crisis. But most people didn't see that. So you kind of have to take apart these pieces of the crisis. Um, the housing bubble is, is something that I think people did see coming and understood that. And as reporters, we're really storytellers. And um, you don't really need a, a finance de degree to understand that there were people who were bidding on houses on, on um, in, in front of their cars, three, four, five people bidding for a house and, and 
sending house prices up so rapidly. That that you could understand. You could understand that at some point that couldn't continue going at 10, 15, 20 percent a year in, in some cases. And so that bursting of the bubble was clear. What that would do, though, is something that, that is less clear and that you kind of have to separate these two issues out. Um, one thing that, that I all, always want to point out is that as reporters, we did cover these stories. And you can go, I can point to stories in 2004, 2005 about the housing boom and how house prices have to keep going up for this to continue and to not end in a very bad, dire scenario. And we had those stories, but we just don't have enough of them. And so um, to say that reporters did enough and covered it enough um, just, I don't think, would be a fair assessment of this because um, you can't take what 90% of people are saying when they're when 90% of people are saying one thing and 10% are saying the other. You can't uh, have that same ratio of coverage in in news stories, and so that's one of the things that we have to account for as the press is this this scale and proportionality to to what should be covered. But there's a, a difficulty there as well in 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 pointing to the dire scenarios. You could do this with any sort of issue, whether it's um, economics, finance, or national security, and nuclear weapons, you can point to all sorts of dire scenarios that, in retrospect, the, the narrative will seem clear. But uh, while you're covering it, it may not actually turn out that way. Um, I want to get back to what David was mentioning um, in a minute, but I, I wanted to carry on with this this theme also. Um, to what degree do you think the public was just not interested? I mean, because I know that when you're reporting on a story, part of agenda setting is getting the public interested in the story, getting people to really attach to the story. And I'm wondering if it was a hard sell to your editors, if it was a hard sell for your readers or your listeners. I mean, if you were writing stories, and, and actually if you go back and you do a content analysis, you can see that stories were written. Um, to what degree was it really hard to get people worked up or to get people to pay attention to this this potential developing crisis? Shouldn't the public always be excited about the macroeconomy? Well, I know we're excited about, like, you know, um, some movie stars <laughs> and things like that, you know, about Tiger Woods, but I'm not so sure about so, these other things. <laughs> so let's imagine something. Let's imagine you can go back in time and tell uh, tell a reporter exactly what's transpired and say, all right, here's how it happens. Go out and, and write some stories warning about what happens. Um, it's harder than it sounds. Um, I, I know now more than I ever wanted to know about uh, what a CDO is and how it works. Um, I don't think I could have gotten on the front page of the Washington Post in 2006 with a story about CDOs and how they're structured in ways that are fundamentally... Maybe you should tell us what a CDO is. <laughs> ...collateralized debt obligation and one of the complicated securities that, that became worthless uh, over the last couple of years. Um, anyway, it... it the truth is, in the, in the details, this thing is really, really complicated. Mm -hmm. And uh, But the nice thing is, at the biggest level, it's really, really simple. We spent too much. We built too much. We uh, Asset prices got run up in, in what was a, a massive credit and uh, real estate bubble. And that's now correcting with disastrous consequences. Um, but when you go from that big picture set of ideas, which there were, as, as Sudeep mentions, you know, Norio Rubini, there were uh, uh, Bob Schiller, there were some very smart economists out there in, in 05, 06 warning of exactly the outcomes we've had. It's just it was a relatively small number of them relative to the universe of really smart economists in the world. Um, uh, it's, uh, it's a lot, it's really hard to write about something that might go wrong as mm -hmm. opposed to something that is going wrong. And, uh, you know, we'll take our lumps, uh, those of us in the, in the press, I wish we had uh, foreseen this better and raised more alarm bells, uh, but can I promise you that that we're not uh, that there's not some new problem uh, generating now and percolating now that we're not covering? Uh, there may well be. Uh, it's it's very hard to know in advance. I think back to two conversations I had in the fall of 2007, a few months into what we would generally call the credit crisis, if you date that back to lending freezing up in August of 07. Um, one was with Nouriel Rubini. The other was uh, with uh, an economist from a major uh, Wall Street bank um, who, Rubini, of course, was saying that we're only in the, the very beginning stages of this. And he had this mapped out on exactly how um, the, the mortgages would hit banks and lending would freeze up and it would be a calamity and, and Dr. Doom was, was proved right in the end. And uh, he, uh, you, you, he, he got it. 
uh, the, the Wall Street economists, most of them, not, not all of them, most of them believe that this was, um, as an economic event, something akin to uh, long-term capital management in 98, maybe the 87 stock market crash. You can point to all sorts of other uh, events that kind of hit the economy a little bit but didn't create um, a, a big crash. And we were debating in the fall of 07 whether we'd actually even go into a recession. And I just found it hard to believe at the time that we wouldn't at least see some kind of a, a recession um, from from lending freezing up the way it, uh, it started to, at least in, in some markets at that point. But you can write both of those stories, and you can write them two times, three times, four times, but until you actually see one of them really playing out, you don't know which is right. And so to take uh, Neil's point, if you actually gave the, uh, the, the, the book on how this came, came up to somebody five years ago, you can write some of these stories, but how much are, are people going to um, receive stories that continue to day after day make the same argument that the world is going to hell? So I have two comments on this. One, I think, to, to, key, off, to key off the point you just made, Sudeep, I think that you know, perhaps it's not your responsibility in the press to, to identify these risk factors and identify these linkages and force them onto your editors and then onto the public. You know, perhaps it's the case that this is really the responsibility of, uh, of regulators and, and uh, uh, you know, uh, federal agencies to, to, to sort of head these things off before before they get to be an issue. So maybe I give you guys a pass on that. That's perhaps one of the things that we learned from this that, you know, I mean, if you can get it past your head, I mean, I could see where it would be hard to sell a story that's very technical in nature because I think most people have very little tolerance for that. Which brings me to my second point, which is that uh, I think the low tolerance of the, of, 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 of the public, on one hand, I understand it, but I think it comes at a pretty big cost. I think that uh, there are other instances in which uh, you know, we've had developments that affect the macro, uh, macro economy that uh, you know, are explainable from a sort of fundamental economic argument that the public is just not going to listen to. And for that matter, uh, policymakers, key policymakers, are probably not going to have the tolerance to listen to it either. One thing that comes into mind is commodity price volatility. There are models that you know, can actually quite easily explain high volatility in commodity prices, but to try to sit down and explain those models or the predictions of those models and the intuition behind those models, oftentimes the intuition is hard to get, uh, to somebody who's not directly in the field is like, you know, herding cats. It's hard to do. And uh, I, I think that, 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 you know, in some sense is a shame. I think it makes the job of policymakers that much harder because I think there is a communication gap. I was going to, um, when Sudeep was talking, I was going to ask, how many of you knew in 2007 or cared in 2007 that, that we were in, heading toward an economic crisis? Did anybody know or care? Okay. How many of you in, in October 2008 thought we were in trouble? <laughs> Okay. Yeah, I think that, that that sort of shows you that I think most people, their lives are complicated, they have families, they have work, um, they have, you know, Paris Hilton and all that stuff to think about. And uh, it's kind of hard to get people's attention onto something that's so complicated and so, in some, many, some ways, very convoluted. But I want to go back to what David was saying earlier um, in our panel discussion. You said that, you know, you could give a little more background on how all this developed and happened. And so I'm wondering if you would just give us a little bit more. Oh, sure. Yeah. Uh, I, I mean, I think uh, some of the stuff has been touched on in the discussion. I, I think the, the broad macro environment, uh, uh, you know, Eddie touched on a little bit, uh, described by, uh, you know, a long period of, 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 of uh, essentially a sanguine global macroeconomic environment. It, you know, it's, it's often called the great moderation. Uh, I think that you know, how one views the, how the great moderation came about, you know, you could view it's, it's, it's uh, good luck, perhaps. Some would say it's good policy. Uh, no matter how you explain it, the bottom line is uh, most developed countries and to some degree uh, developing countries as well experience a prolonged period of, of, of low macro volatility. Uh, and I think that's significant. I think we talk about the, the repricing of risk. And I, I, I think that the great moderation inadvertently may, may have played into that. When you're in a macro environment with low volatility, uh, you know, the world unfortunately is not described by rational expectations. I think people have a way of taking recent history and projecting it as, as something that's going to continue on. And if you are, you know, if, uh, you, you know, you're used to an environment of low macro volatility and you expect that that's what's going to happen in the future. But if you expand your sort of data set, 
you know, back another 50, 60, 70 years, you're going to see that there's a lot more volatility out there. And maybe tail risk is not so surprising when you consider a longer history. Uh, so I think, uh, you know, the general macro environment of, 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 of low volatility, you know, perhaps led to a, a, a reassessment of people's attitudes towards risk. Uh, if you layer in, uh, Eddie touched a little bit on uh, the global imbalances prior to, uh, prior to 2000. 7, 2008, they've only now started to, to correct themselves a little bit uh, with, a, with a big influx of, of, of foreign savings coming into the U.S. to fund, uh, um, you know, pretty extreme U.S. consumption behavior. Um, coupled with uh, a prolonged period after the bursting of the tech bubble of, of, of low, low, low interest rates in, 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 in the U.S., um, these things all sort of taken together, if you throw in also the, uh, you know, the development of the shadow banking system and, and you know, the growth of security, you know, the, the security, securitization of asset markets, uh, throw these things all together, it's sort of like a, a cocktail that, that, that sort of led into the building up of asset prices. And I think, uh, you know, Sudip and Neil touched on, uh, um, you know, a relaxing of lending standards, uh, which probably fed into housing demand, which, you know, then pushed housing prices up even even higher. Uh, and then I think the story starts to really play out when the Fed started tightening rates in, uh, in, in uh, I guess it was 04, was it before 04? Yeah, something like late 04. Uh, the Fed started tightening rates, and that sort of, you know, started to, to, to as Neil pointed out, to, to, to prick, you know, the high house prices. House prices started to come down. Firms' balance sheets started eroding, and I think it's when the, the erosion of those balance sheets that, that sort of kicked it off. Uh, and then th there was sort of a tipping point in uh, the summer of, I'm forgetting what it was, 07, uh, with uh, you know the, you know the, the, the deterioration of these, uh, of these, of the of these of firms' balance sheets. I think uh, put us in a situation where. Um, yeah, essentially, people got scared. I think in 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 how uh, how assets were valued, um, the default risk on those assets um, in the public and in the private sector, and also amongst uh, federal officials, uh, just a complete lack of transparency about those assets, how they're valued, and what's the risk associated with them. And what, when that happened, I think there was a there was there was a there was a, a, a big panic. And that, I think, is what stemmed the, the, the credit crunch. Once the credit crunch kicked in, then I think, you know, asset price, you know, lending stops, credit seizes up. Uh, asset that sort of feeds into the, the real side of the economy, which then, you know, feeds back into the financial side, and this creates just a big downward spiral. Um, and things, things get pretty bad. Um, so then I think that probably leads us into what policymakers did about it. I don't know if you want to go there yet. Sure. Or, yeah, so I mean, so, you know, the policy response, at least on the part of the Fed, uh, pretty clear cut, I think, to drop interest rates quickly. Uh, and I think the, the, the fall in rates beginning in, I guess it was late 2007 into the end of 2008, December, when they hit the zero lower bound, the drop in rates was, uh, that, that's unprecedented. It's, uh, it's about as fast as as it's uh, as fast and as far as it's as it's been ever, um, so with rates at the zero lower bound, sort of conventional monetary policy is is sort of shot. You've done all you can do, uh, and the truth of the matter is, it doesn't really fix the core of the problem. The core of the problem is that the private sector is not lending, so uh, that led the Fed, in conjunction with the Treasury and some other some other agents, the FDIC, to sort of concentrate on a unique set of policies to to. Uh, to operate directly on the source of the problem, which is the lack of lending in the private sector. And the Fed, for its part, uh, has come up with, I think, a pretty in innovative, uh, I think central banking has is, is probably been, the history of central banking has probably been changed uh, by what happened over the past two years, um, spurred by uh, the development of a set of policy tools on the part of the Fed that, you know, long story short, different policies designed to operate on different aspects of lending in the macro economy, interbank lending, uh, you know, lending in commercial paper markets, in money markets, uh, the expansion of the Fed's uh, balance sheet and the shift in its composition. The Fed, you know, spent a lot of, um, 
you know, purchasing assets out there that in normal times, I think under normal monetary policy, the Fed would never consider doing that. But in, in these particular instances, to sort of operate on the markets that needed to be operated on and to get credit flowing again, I think the feeling was it was necessary to go in and, and sort of purchase some of these assets uh, to sort of fix the core of the problem, which is a lack of, of credit and lending. Um, the sort of postscript, I think, is in general, I think, uh, in terms of healing financial markets, both the actions of the Fed and I think uh, internationally other central banks as well, I think the end result has been actually pretty good. We don't want to pat ourselves on the back too much, but, uh, you know, credit markets have, have improved quite a bit. Uh, the work's not done, uh, and there's a lot of work to be done on the real side of the economy, but I think it is... You know, the, the role of the central bank in a credit crunch is to get credit flowing again. To that end, I, I, I think that, that the innovative policies that the Fed came up with, and other central banks as well, did, did in fact quite a, quite a nice job, in my opinion. Obviously, I'm biased. Um, I, have, God, I, have so many, I have so many questions. Um, I guess one of the questions that I have um, concerns how all of this is being communicated to the public, because I keep hearing that, oh, no, there's still a credit crunch, people aren't getting money, and I'm wondering why is that, why is that urban myth, if it's an urban myth, still out there, if this is going on? What, why hasn't, what's been the miscommunication because people still seem panicked, or am I just misreading it? I think maybe I'll, I'll say two words on this really briefly, and then you guys can jump in. I, I'd say it's, it's not a myth. I think that, that, that credit markets are, are certainly, by, by no stretch of the imagination, are they really completely healed. Mm -hmm. I think it's, it's, you know, the policies have been effective in sort of bringing us back from the brink. Uh, and, and, and to that end, I, th I think that the policies have been effective. Like I said, there, in my opinion, there's more work to do. You guys probably have more to say about that. Perhaps. There, <laughs> there are... I guess there's the, the credit, um, different ways you could uh, break up the credit availability issue. One is who qualifies for credit, and people who qualify for credit three years ago do not qualify for credit now, and that's why there's probably more of a, a sense in the public that credit is less available. And the other is that there is a clear evidence that banks have tightened lending, and it is harder to get loans for for um, people who, who are of at least on the edge, and people who aren't on the edge have greater difficulty getting loads, and businesses certainly do. That's just a general case with the weakening of the economy. You saw that back in uh, 1991 as well with that recession. So um, you still have that same problem, and it's being communicated through, as, as reporters, we communicate it often through the people who are facing that difficulty of getting loans and through the macro data that we get from the Fed and from others, and it's I think that's pretty clear what uh, the problem is. The, the difficulty in a lot of this is the prescription. How do you deal with it? You can come up with all sorts of sums of money to throw at various problems without knowing that they're going to work. And um, I, that we've probably been doing that to some extent uh, with the, the TARP money and creating many different programs to see what sticks. And uh, some of it has and some of it hasn't. And um, in the, the most recent cases, we can see that mortgage modifications from TARP have not worked, and uh, some small business lending programs could uh, work in the coming uh, year or so from TARP, but we don't actually know and won't know until after you've actually tried some of those. Um, lending has come back. <laughs> um, but, you know, what's it come back to? Are we going to go back to the good old days of mortgage lending? I'm going to talk about mortgage lending. We're going to go back to the good old days of Alte, liar loans. Yes, I'm a janitor. I make $200,000, and I want to buy a million-dollar home. Okay, sure, here's the money. Or are we going to go back to the fundamentals? Are we going to go back to responsible lending? Are we going to go back to, you know, where we were, you know, before the, before the whole bubble started? Are we going to go back to put some money down, have some skin in the game, and we'll give you a, you know, a mortgage that you can afford? And so... <laughs> It's very easy to argue, no, it hasn't come back, because, you know, it would be very, e be very easy to argue, you know, somebody who would have got a mortgage a couple of years still c ago still can't get a mortgage. But on the other hand, we're best back to where we should have been, you know, perhaps before the whole craziness started. Um, I want to ask a question of our reporters on the panel. Uh, you know, w one, I hope I'm not being Pollyannish when I say this, but one of the ideas of, of the press is that they're a watchdog of government, that they're you know, always watching government to make sure that they're doing what's right for the people. And I'm wondering how this is going to change your relationship now with, go with government officials, or, or is it, or is your reporting going to be different now because you realize that perhaps this is the biggest event in your reporting lifetime? 
And I'm kind of curious what you think about that. Well, we were talking earlier, uh, it's already changed our relations with government officials in that we've gotten a lot more 6 a.m. Uh, phone calls about some new facility they're about to announce that uh, we have to wake up and, and write about. Uh, but, but more seriously, um, I think this has uh, made all of us more aware of the ways that uh, People in government and business and, and the experts and the economists we quote and talk to all the time uh, of the blind spots that, uh, that, that they all have and that we all have. Um, and uh, seeing that such a massive set of, of frailties and imbalances could develop under the noses of, of so many smart people, uh, I think uh, if, if you're not a little more skeptical of received wisdom about what's happening in the world of finance and economics after that, then uh, anyway, I, I think it will certainly make uh, make all of us more skeptical of received wisdom from, from economists and government officials and the financial world. I, I certainly think we've already seen in our, the last year or so this in, in the reporting about regulation and about efforts to overhaul regulation, certainly more skepticism about whether this approach is actually the right one, the way some, some policymakers say with a greater degree of conviction that my approach is the right one. Um, the Fed chairman says this approach is the right one. The Treasury Secretary has a slightly different take that's the right one. Um, the, uh, the FDIC chair has another take that's the right one. And so we, we tend to play them, all of those off each other a little bit more and, uh, and maybe challenge them a little bit more than, uh, than we did before, I guess. The, the real test of this will be five years from now, whether the lessons are learned, and not whether we're just doing the one story, but doing more of them. Because if you look at, the, in, in all of these crises, look back to, to 1999 and early 2000, there were many, many stories written about how this boom in stocks cannot continue. It just doesn't make any sense. It's got to, to burst at some point. Um, but for every one of those stories, there were 50 about uh, another company and um, uh, another secretary becoming a millionaire. And all of those can, can kind of weigh on people's perceptions of what's going on. And there were numerous stories in 04, 05, and 06 about what happens if this assumption about house prices continuing to go up is wrong, but they were outweighed by all the other stories about uh, what was actually happening at the time because they're great human interest stories about people getting homes when they couldn't afford one before and people getting very big homes that they couldn't afford before. And um, we don't know, obviously, what the, the next crisis is, but right now I can already tell that there's more challenging of, of uh, the views, whether it's from government or, or the private sector. Of um, Some say that the economy is going to come uh, roaring back over the next uh, six months and we've come out of the worst of it. And a number of others say that uh, we're we're in this for another two or three years of, of a downturn. And um, when you put yourself in that position, it's very hard for us to write the story right now and say what's going to happen, because then um, our readers would call us biased. And so there's a, a, a check on that. But the, the idea is, is hopefully to continue challenging those viewpoints in a very public and repeated fashion. Um, I have one additional question that I actually thought of this weekend with the whole crisis in Dubai and the banking situation and the financial situation in Dubai. How much reporting are we doing on the financial crisis globally? I know, you know, we're obviously in America and we like to report on what's happening with the American economy, but are there um, waves happening in the world that are going to affect us and that we need to know about? Do we need to pay more attention to what's going on globally with other countries like Dubai? Uh, or are we going to face the same problem, wake up one morning and realize, oh, we're in a big, we have trouble, <laughs> we're in big trouble? I think, yeah, to, first of all, this is not purely an American crisis. This is, uh, you know, the same boom that uh, created, uh, you know, million-dollar McMansions in Prince William County, Virginia. Also, uh, you can see in the, in the big towers in Dubai or Shanghai, you can see it in Spanish housing prices or Australian housing prices, you, you, you name it, go around the world. And you can find the impact of this credit uh, credit bubble that's that's now popped, and you can now see the consequences of that in, in unemployment around the world. Um, to answer the question, yes, this is a global story. Uh, we're not doing our job if we don't present a global picture. Um, and uh, obviously, that that kind of news is maybe less appealing to an American audience, but uh, I think most of us try and do it anyway. 
there's there's some of that. That's this all comes back to the the. I think the central conundrum that we face often as reporters is how much imagination do you use in conceiving of possible crises and, and writing about them. We can do a lot in covering what's going on now in the world and with, uh, with our hundreds of, of uh, staffers outside the U.S. I think we do that, but in imagining what could happen and, and being prescient in that sense, that's very difficult. As somebody who um, used to cover energy and, and write about OPEC, I kind of got, um, I, I may be a little obsessed with thinking about what would happen if OPEC were to, to decide that the dollar wasn't what they wanted to use, and they did it in a back room in, uh, in uh, the Intercontinental in Vienna, and that led to um, the, the 11 OPEC uh, members at the time deciding, well, maybe we'll pick up a few more, more uh, euros, and that was five years into the euro, maybe now uh, 10 years or 15 years into it. Um, they, they decide to, to go even further. The dollar drops a little bit more. You have a, a deeper panic about the dollar. Um, that leads the, the Chinese to decide to do something else with their debt, and we, we can, I, can, I can keep taking this out a, a few steps further and what that means to the, uh, the manufacturer in Ohio that's already lost all of its uh, GM plants and the dealers and, and you can, you can um, probably imagine you can a few more a story steps. If you, uh, right, you <laughs> can imagine a few more steps, but you could also do that in 2005 with um, what happens if uh, house prices start going down and, uh, and a few people actually did do that and uh, imagine a, a global crisis. And um, I, I did this all the time with, uh, with oil markets and, and seeing what happens uh, in a certain strait in the Persian Gulf and um, <laughs> if that gets blocked and what $250 oil means and what that does to the global economy. I think uh, from a viewpoint of a macroeconomist, I think the, the international angle of this crisis is, 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 is critical. And uh, I think the, the policy response, uh, the, probably arguably one of the rare instances in which you saw pretty broad cooperation amongst a, a wide and diverse set of central banks uh, to, to, uh, to, to, to ease the initial credit crisis, I, I think were that cooperation not there, I think the job would have been much, much harder. Um, I think it would be very curious to see what, how that cooperation holds up or does not hold up going forward uh, as we come out of the battle, well, you know, come out of the, the, the back end of the healing of credit markets and uh, as, a, as we turn attention more towards, uh, towards, towards getting the real economy back on track. Uh, it would be interesting to see how that co cooperation holds up if, if it does. Um, I have one last question I'd like to ask um, before I turn to the audience. Um, when we publicized, when we publicized this roundtable, we noted that uh, economist Robert Lucas asked this question recently: What can the public reasonably expect of specialists in these areas, meaning finance and reporting, and how well has it been served by them in the current crisis? So, what can the public expect, and how well has it been served by those of you at the table? What do you think? Self-assessment time. <laughs> uh, I'd be happy to sit it. Oh, so you're reaching for the mic. No, no, I start, it, start. It, you start. Uh, I'll, I'll be brief. I think uh, what can the public expect from, from uh, policymakers speaking from the perspective of the Federal Reserve? I think what the public can expect is that uh, Federal Reserve will, will uh, you know, expend max, maximum effort sort of understanding on events, how they unfold. Uh, I think the public can expect that uh, the central bank will try to communicate as effectively as possible and as transparent a manner as possible uh, what those developments mean for the economy, uh, both the U.S. and the global economy going forward, uh, what, if anything, policymakers can do about it. Um, I, I think what, what, the, what the public should expect is that policymakers should communicate what they know quickly efficiently and as transparently as possible. Uh, I, I, you know, again, I'm an employee of the Federal Reserve. I, th I think that, that over the, the course of the past two years, and maybe if you go back over a longer history, five, seven years, I think the Fed has made pretty large strides towards improving its transparency. Perhaps some might argue, argue we were starting from a pretty low base, but uh, I, I think we've worked hard to improve our transparency, uh, and I think you can expect that to continue. I, I'll, I'll add, um, 
you know, there, there's one thing we know about the next crisis and the next recession is what will not cause it. And it's not going to be a uh, housing bubble. It's not going to be the collapse of securitization markets. It's not going to be even dot-com stocks. Uh, history repeats itself. It doesn't repeat itself exactly. And, um, you know, what I think we all need to, to be able to do is, is look for uh, things that seem too good to be true and have a, have a realistic uh, assessment of, of, of the economy and the world in front of us. Uh, but at the same time, an understanding of, of the limits of human knowledge. If you remember, Alan Greenspan gave a speech in which he talked about irrational exuberance in the stock market, uh, saying the stock market might be getting a little, little frothy, a little out of hand. Well, he gave that speech in 1996. And if you remember, tech stocks and the entire stock market had about four or five more years left to, left to run at that time. Um, you know, it's, it's really hard to tell these things in advance, but what you can do is say, you know what, buying a dot-com stock uh, for a company that has no earnings for uh, $100 a share uh, no and losses as far as the eye can see, that's probably not a good idea. And buying a million-dollar house when I make $50,000 a year probably isn't a good idea either. Um, and uh, so I hate to be simplistic, but, but uh, using just some, some good straightforward judgment and making your own economic decisions can take you a long way in avoiding the, the ill effects of, of these recessions. I mean, if we're, if we're preparing for the next, you know, for the next, you know, cycle, and cycles happen, you know, one of the things we have to take is to um, think about the mechanisms that can be designed to stop these, whether it's different types of regulation. I'm not a, you know, I'm not an expert in regulation, but, you know, the, there's been some articles recently published, um, you know, some big fights in acad academia. Uh, Paul Krugman, of course, came out and blasted academic economics. Um, basically since the 1930s, I guess, um, very openly in the New York Times, there's been a lot of responses, um, particularly interesting, for, ins for example, was a response by John Cochran from the University of Chicago gave a very, very interesting response. But one of the things we have learned, and one of the things that's, that's really um, central in a lot of economic um, you know, s schools these days are mechanism designs, and not only using traditional economics, but also trying to put you know, some of the behavioral aspects behind them. Um, for instance, there's a book, um, very, the book I just finished uh, reading, Nudge, that talks about a lot about how the behavioral aspects can be put into this. How do we design the mechanisms to regulate? And, and as has just been alluded to, it has to be very general. We don't know where the next bubble is going to come. You know, people are, people are extremely resilient. The mortgage broker that was selling these, these mortgages a few years ago has now, you know, is now setting up businesses to, to promote short sales down in down in Florida. <laughs> you know, these people will come back in a different guise, and they're they're very smart. They'll make money, you know. But, you know, we have to be able to keep up with them and design mechanisms that perhaps will will guard against the next bubble. And that's that's a real challenge out there. I was just uh, add to all of this. The the most important lesson out of this is to just continue. Uh, and do it in a, in a more prominent way, questioning assumptions about models, about policy, and that just doesn't happen on a frequent enough basis. Each of these, um, the, the last two uh, recessions we've gone through, each had basic assumptions, one about house prices, another about, uh, about um, the internet at, at, at the core and technology that uh, were obviously far, uh, uh, hyped far too much, and so just questioning that uh, those assumptions in a in a repeated fashion is is probably what's Im important as a lesson, not just for journalists, but for um, policymakers and for people in, in the public. To because I I do as much as I um, hate to uh, to give my angry readers um, any credit, but when I when I do get some some notes about things like this, I will. Um, be forced to think about it a little bit more and, and uh, add a little bit more um, skepticism to some of my reporting and my questioning. And so there is a, a, a feedback loop in all of this. Okay, what I'd like to do now is um, I'm going to go over to that side. Of the uh, hi, I'm Colin Delaney with ePolitics.com. Um, just I've been struck by uh, what seems to come up a lot is um, how you evaluate risk from, from things that are uh, low probability events in a given year. You talked about tail effects, I think. It reminded me a little bit of things like hurricanes, tsunamis, asteroid strikes, you know, things that don't happen very often, but when they do, they're potentially catastrophic. So with, with sort of natural phenomena like that, we have uh, put up a lot of monitoring. Um, again, you know, 
transparency and the lack thereof has come up. What kind of monitoring and information systems can we put out? Are there ways that um, just raw data can be put out and crowdsourced, you know, um, uh, so, that, so that the policymakers have more tools to work with, I guess? So, I think I think it's a tough question, uh, and, and I think that uh, I believe it was uh, I believe it was Neil that that, that hit on this before. Uh, there were people out there that that sort of, uh, you know, guys like Nouriel Rabini who sort of, you know, they and, and, and Rob Robert Schiller who sort of see how these things were interconnected. But frankly, uh, the majority of us miss the interconnectedness, and I think if you didn't, why did they miss the interconnectedness of it? I mean, I think it had to do with probably a lot of things. I think there's a, you know, uh, the opaqueness of financial instruments, uh, you know, a lack of understanding of, of uh, s uh, systemically important firms. Uh, a lot changed in, in financial markets over the course of the last, ten, it seems as though, a lot changed in, in financial markets over the course of the last 10 to 15 years that uh, I, I think the bottom line is we, we just, we didn't understand the inter interconnectedness of it. So I think to be able to address this, to price that risk, you have to understand the underlying asset. And, and the failure is that just didn't understand the underlying asset. So to solve the problem, you raise a good question. When the next bubble comes along, you know, is there, you know, what, what's the likelihood that, that we're going to miss whatever interconnectedness with the, with the broader macro economy is going to be associated with, with that bubble? I don't have an answer for that. I doubt anyone does, uh, which is why I, I guess I think that the bottom line is in terms of, 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 of regulation and, and supervision, coming back to sort of solid economic principles and, and, and responsible behavior is probably, you know, it's probably the, the, the best safeguard against that, that of all. But I think still there are going to be uh, linkages and transmission channels that, that we don't understand now uh, until, until after sort of things spill out. It's a, I think it's a tough question. Well, one little thing that, not one little thing, one big thing that uh, people in, at uh, uh, your employer are, are, are working on, which is, um, you know, bank supervision in the past, bank regulation has been uh, relatively narrow, where you have guys who go into a bank and try and figure out what risks they're taking and make sure they're not exposing themselves, make sure they're safe and sound and uh, not exposing themselves to too much risk, which is a pretty narrow viewpoint. And uh, the direction the Fed is moving now is, uh, macro prudential regulation, which is uh, uh, saying let's let's have uh, economists involved, people looking at the big picture, looking at the connections between banks, the connections. If you have a bunch of uh, banks all exposing themselves to the same kinds of risks at the same time, that can create risks to the broader economy. Let's make sure we understand those linkages and connections. Uh, hopefully, that uh, that approach is more successful than what's been done in the past. And maybe that will mean that the next crisis will, will be another single firm, like LTCM, creating a problem for everyone else rather than um, a, a wider number of companies. And, well, and also assuming the Fed doesn't lose its bank supervision powers <laughs> in the next. That leads me to one question. Um, I, I had been talking to someone of the weekend, and they said that really what happened is Wall Street did an end run around regulators and, um, and the Fed. Is that true? Do you think that the Wall Street just outsmarted regulators and they knew how to get around regulations, or were people not paying attention? I mean, is that a tough question to think about? There's some of that. Um, so the, the, the firms that went under fastest and most dramatically uh, include the investment banks, which were technically regulated by the SEC, but not really. I mean, you know, the Bear Stearns and Lehman Brothers were overseen by the SEC, but that really isn't what the SEC does. Uh, those were some of the earliest collapses. AIG was basically overseen by nobody. Uh, the, the division of AIG, anyway, that, was, uh, that really caused it to collapse really did not have any government oversight. Uh, I think that both the Fed and other bank regulators have some more culpability when you look at um, uh, Bank of America, Citigroup, Wachovia, uh, some of those big institutions. But a lot of the big companies where this thing was, uh, and a lot of the uh, you know retail level mortgage brokers, uh, bank regulators had no authority over whatsoever. So uh, there's plenty of blame to go around, and and no one would hold uh, our regulators, including the Fed, blameless. They would absolutely have some culpability, but. Some of this did happen outside the regulated sector. Okay, do we have more questions? I just had a question about, I guess, commercial real estate. You see like the MIT, the Moody's MIT commercial real estate market uh, still tanking. 
And you hear a lot of economists saying that it's not going to have a big impact. The same thing that they said about the, uh, the housing sector not having a big impact before it hit a financial meltdown. And what do you see in the Fed that, uh, why don't you believe that the commercial real estate is going to have an effect on the economy? And what do you as journalists start asking other economists who said the same thing about housing? <laughs> do you press them more and do you, do you fight your editors to try and get these stories in that may not have happened that you wanted to about the housing crisis but you weren't able to get in? And like, how do you, I guess, ask the proper questions to make sure it doesn't happen with this? Yeah, go ahead. From, from, I guess from the from the macro perspective, uh, uh, so 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 non-res, I think is 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 uh, a, a soft spot. I think it seems like it's likely to be a soft spot for the economy going forward. Um, I, you know, I think it's a downside risk factor for for the recovery. Um, Having said that, uh, what what makes non-res different from housing, say, in 2007? I think probably what makes it different is uh, somebody had pointed out earlier, you know, housing prices uh, started to fall uh, long before the rest of the macro economy sort of went south. Uh, and a lot of the concern was, well, you know, the decline in the housing market was relatively self-contained. It, it stayed within the housing market in, in, in the Fed uh, and you know, other macro forecasters uh, were uh, spending a lot of time and effort looking for signs that the, the deterioration of the housing market would spill over into the broader macro economy. Well, we all know that that happened. Uh, so, uh, you know, I mean, you're now looking at, uh, uh, you know, in terms of resource utilization, we have, we have huge spare capacity in, in, you know, in product markets and labor markets. Uh, uh, the real side of the economy is, 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 is pretty soft right now. Um, I, I, you know, the spillover's already been done. Uh, so I think in that sense, um, uh, you know, the, the uh, you know, non-res construction is a relatively small part of, of, of total GDP, given that I think the spillover has happened through a lot of other markets. I, I, I guess my personal view is I wouldn't be so concerned about that. Uh, but I think the, the sector will be a drag on the economy going forward, perhaps for quite some time to come. I, I weave that point into stories a lot, and I can, in the last two months, give you half a dozen big stories that uh, our paper has done on this issue. And so it comes back to the, the question of how, how, how much is enough, and how much are you trying to inform, and how much are you trying to th then advocate for something to happen, or um, that, that something is, like commercial real estate, is so bad that it deserves more attention than uh, everything else, like the, the state of consumers or the fact that stimulus money is going to uh, ultimately be a, a drag on the economy in the second half of next year when it, it goes away. So there are all sorts of things that you can bring up that would be drags on the economy. The, it's a question of, of scope of how much attention you put on each one of them. Um, I, I would like to think that through our reporting, people are at least aware that this is a problem um, and it's not it's not. It wouldn't be a total surprise to them once um, you see more individual companies uh, start to go down. We've already seen that in, in a few cases, but um, that that leaves uh, again the question of of how much do do you want to read and how much do people already know about it? Okay, we have another question. Um, hello, this is Jose Manuel Bassat. I'm a senior communications officer at the World Bank. In the discussion, I've seen a lot of focus on policymakers, on economic actors, and also on media as, as intermediaries or interpreters between policymakers and, and society. But I, the piece I see missing somehow is, is the public, the, the so, citizens themselves. And I'm, I'm asking in, in this conversation, this discussion, are we satisfied as a society with the basic level of knowledge that the average citizen has about, about the core economic and, and financial issues? And uh, I mean, what does what needs to be done or could be done to improve that, that financial literacy, that economic literacy. I think being literate today, 2009, is very different from being literate 30 years ago. So is it enough to have more transparency from the Fed and other governmental agencies? Is it, is it enough to have uh, very specialized reporters who know and, and write about those issues if society as a whole doesn't have the capacity to absorb that, that knowledge? Thing? That's an excellent question. I was actually afraid to go there. <laughs> okay, what does another panel give you your best shot? <laughs> I'd like to say that society as a whole does have the knowledge. I think uh, 
one of the big differences between um, an advanced society and a more primitive society is not that the individual has more knowledge. It's not to say that, you know, I as an economist have more knowledge than, than a farmer in, in, a, you know, in a poor village in India who knows, you know, to do a lot of things. It's just that his neighbor is doing the same thing. He's sowing, you know, the rice and he's, he's harvesting the rice and so is the neighbor and so is the neighbor's neighbor and etc. The thing is, in a modern society, we're able to coordinate knowledge. That doesn't mean that everybody has to have a good level of knowledge of anything as long as we can coordinate across. Um, now, does that mean that everybody should have more financial literacy? <clears throat> Very difficult question. I've, I've, you know, you hear many things that kids in high school should be given classes on how to manage, you know, how to, how to manage their checkbook. On the other hand, um, we could come across and we could say in a very paternalistic way, perhaps we need to change the way things are done. You know, we know that a worker who starts working in a company, if the default is that they get 0% put in their 401k, a lot of them won't put anything away in their 401k and will be myopic and not think about their retirement. On the other hand, if the firm is paternalistic, and I mean that in the best way um, possible, and says the default is to put 10% of their income into a 401k, a lot of people will just go ahead and not change it, because that's just what people do. People have a million things to worry about, and a lot of these things that we're talking about, you know, are not as interesting as, as what happened with Tiger Woods' car on, on, <laughs> on Saturday night. And the meltdown in Dubai is not as interesting as, as you know, what's going on here or, or the uh, trespasses into the, uh, into the state uh, dinner the other week. I mean, there's, at a simple level, um, people don't understand how basic financial stuff works on a kind of intuitive level. It's amazing how many studies there are of how many people, educated people, not not stupid people at all, uh, uh, you know, can't grasp compound interest and can't grasp kind of very simple uh, financial concepts, um, which I guess does argue for a certain form of paternalism. I mean, hell, I you know, I have an MBA. I I write about this stuff, and I got a credit card disclosure in the mail yesterday with three pages of of new terms of my credit card. I didn't read it. I, you know, I just I I, I don't want to. Um, and so, and so you've seen that with some of these issues like overdraft fees from banks. You've seen it with, with credit card rules um, where regulators are saying, you know what, people don't understand. Disclosure isn't enough. Just, just requiring that people disclose a lot of information about the, the loan product or the bank account they're, they're taking, that's not enough for, for a lot of people. Uh, these things are kind of complex and, and not intuitive for a lot of people. So we're just going to regulate it and say, you know, you can't, you can't charge people a bunch of overdraft fees in a kind of exploitative way. You can't. Uh, do these things, and I'm not sure if that's the wrong approach, given the way a lot of people view uh, view these things. I, I guess one of the questions that I was going to ask is, you know, to what degree do we hold a secretary or, or somebody making fifty thousand dollars a year who wants to buy, you know, a two million or million dollar home? To what degree do we we hold them accountable when they sign on the dotted line, knowing that? they're maybe never going to be able to pay for that home. You know, to what degree are they responsible and to what degree is the lending agency responsible or the bank responsible? And, you know, so, so where, where is personal responsibility in this equation? Well, there's absolutely, a, I mean, you know, we, we had a story in, in the Post uh, just the other day about a woman who, I can't remember the numbers, but uh, had a very low income and, and you know, was buying a million dollar house for some reason and, and was shocked when the, when she was signing the form and said it was a $3,000 uh, a month mortgage and her income was $2,500 a month. And, um, you know, for her to sign that paper was dishonest and not something anyone should do. You also wonder what, what you're thinking as a lender uh, making it, and I don't think that's going to happen again. I mean, we're, we're, the new normal does not involve making loans to people who clearly can't afford them. Um, no, absolutely. There's, there's, uh, people need to be responsible for their own decisions. Um, it takes two to have a bad loan. Any, anybody, else? <laughs> anybody else have any questions, sir? Okay. After uh, Enron and WorldCom, um, Arthur Anderson was torn apart, and we had Sarbanes Oxley. It seems that the rating agencies are getting some slaps and some low flack in the press, but don't really seem to see anything coming for them. What's your impression from both a policy and from a reporting perspective? I guess from a policy perspective, I think that, uh, you know, I think, uh, you know, the common wisdom 
to the degree that there is common wisdom towards this, is that, that rating agencies uh, likely shared some of the blame in, in uh, misrepresenting the, uh, the underlying riskiness of, of, of assets in the economy. Um, to the degree that that's true, then uh, they share some of the responsibility, I think, for uh, the fallout from that. Um, seems to me it's potentially a, a pretty big problem. Um, I don't know where policymakers stand on, on uh, reform for rating agencies. I, I personally don't know much about that. Uh, if what you said is true, that, that they're sort of being, you know, ignored, uh, I, I think, uh, I, I guess I'm surprised at that. Uh, and I would expect that to change in the not too distant future. Um, I think that's probably all I'd have to say about that. Myself. It's tough. Uh, you, you <laughs> Please. I, they are get, I think they are getting some attention, but the, the question with rating agencies then goes to what do you do about them? And with almost all of the regulatory debate right now, you're, you're falling down on some ideological lines on, on far more government involvement or trying to make a market system work. And there is some view that there would be more skepticism of what the rating agencies produce, and investors will be more more skeptical. There are um, there there is probably going to be more reliance on on alternatives to rating agencies um, from some investors, and, and they may do more of, of their homework. But once you come down to that line of how much government do you involve in that, there there you could you could think of a, a lot of other ways to set up rating agencies with a, a government. Uh, uh, seal of approval on uh, what they do and, and government clearance of their standards. Um, but I just don't see that going anywhere in Congress. And um, I'm given how, how, how much innovation can get around the uh, in, innovation, I should put in quote marks, um, get, get around the, the knowledge that regulators have. I'm not sure what, what effect that would have in the end. I, th I think I think it's a critical issue. I mean, I, I think that a, a, a big part of the problem is a, a lack of understanding or a lack of transparency. I've said that phrase many, many times tonight. I think uh, you know if you can't value the underlying assets that you're buying, if you do, or you know if if for some reason you know history has suggested that rating agency X says you know the the risk profile of this asset is blah, and you accept that in full faith, but in fact that's not actually true. Uh, that's that's that lack of transparency or that opaqueness is a huge problem. Uh, I think the the principal agent problem that that leads to that uh, that that leads to uh, rating agencies, whether it's uh, malevol malevolently or um, you know for whatever reason risk misrepresenting the amount of risk in an underlying asset. Um, I, 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 you know, a large part of of, of what generated. This crisis, in my opinion, has to do with information asymmetries, principal agent problems, and people just not understanding risk return profiles. You want to solve the problem, you know, have transparency, have opaqueness about the assets, and people are smart enough to make smart decisions. Uh, they just need the information. Uh, so, so I see that as actually potentially something that, that you know, it's, it, it's, a, it's a critical hole in the armor, so to speak. <laughs> Okay, does anybody else have any questions for our panel? Anybody else want? Oh, one more, okay. I have a question for the, uh, the, uh, the reporters. Uh, what was it like, the, uh, let's say the week after the crisis started, uh, let's say after like, Lehman Brothers collapsed in terms of how you uh, sort of got your information, try to get a grasp of the story, who you talked to. What was it like sort of that one week or two week, whatever? Uh, when, when, that, when that happened? Four months. Four months. <laughs> seven months. How much panic in the newsroom? <laughs> okay. um, I, w I wouldn't say there was ever, there were, it was a lot of, we exchange information a lot. And so there's, there are, we have at the journal, two reporters covering the Fed, two uh, on, on Treasury, and we're, we're all trying to figure out what the next moves are. That's um, a, a case where you're trying to do two things. One is assess what people are actually doing. That's the, the reporting part of it, of seeing what the, um, the various proposals coming out of government are and how they're being received in Congress. The other is doing the analysis of what makes the most sense. Does it make sense to create auctions to buy up bad mortgages um, at or near par? Does it make sense 
to recapitalize banks, and you try to present some of those options, um, it is very difficult when you're moving that quickly to to do them both at the same time enough. So a lot of what we're, what we end up doing is is analyzing the various options that are coming out of government, and they've often come together and, and decided this is the the best approach. Um, but uh, over those, I guess, four weeks from um, the Lehman weekend that led into AIG up to um, the the middle of October when of 2008, when there was the bank recapitalization, there there were just so many um, moving parts in government that that's why it was so confusing to people in the public, both investors and the general public, and um, business leaders and managers who are making those decisions about whether they needed to start cutting jobs, about what to do, and that's. That's just the nature of any crisis, and you're going to see that in, in any uh, crisis going forward when it, things are happening so quickly. It's just it's going to create confusion, and that, that creates the, the psychology element in any crisis that is impossible to really understand is when does something go from, from a, uh, a, a known issue to, to, to more of an explosion like we saw with, uh, with September and October of 08 when we knew there were things building up, but when does that go to a, to a full blown meltdown? And that's really something you can't predict because it involves fear and it involves psychology. It's, it's hard to it's hard to overstate how chaotic chaotic's the wrong word how uh, how closely packed in time everything was last September October. Uh, Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac were put under conservatorship, taken over by the government one weekend. Following weekend, Lehman Brothers went under. Merrill Lynch was bought by Bank of America. Two days after that, AIG was uh, was nationalized. Two days after that, the TARP was proposed. Uh, three days after that, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley were turned into bank holding companies. The TARP was voted down. It passed. They put money in banks. They created all these new facilities to support this market and that market and the other market. Um, it, it, it's kind of a blur still looking back on it. And... Um, you know, I, I um, it, it was it was grueling, and uh, what Sudeep describes is, is right. There's a lot of, you know, you're talking to your colleagues all the time, um, for, who cover different, uh, and, and you at least have the benefit of 200 people covering Wall Street in the financial sector per se. Well, a lot, <laughs> a lot more than we have. Uh, uh, you know, a lot of it's kind of information arbitrage, trying to put together whatever you can get in, uh, from from one source in one corner of the world and bring that to people in another side of the world and, and, and try and vet it. One, one real challenge during this period was that all of our sources were working 20 hours a day and not available. You know, people who normally you could call up and make an appointment and have a leisurely phone call or go in and chat with for a while, uh, who had been good sources over time, were exhausted and working. Kind of, they were busy. They were trying to save the world. Um, so, you know, it, it was tricky, you know, a lot of, like, quick email communication as opposed to, uh, with Blackberry as opposed to a nice leisurely phone interview. Um, you know, a lot of just, just logistical challenges, but also just the murkiness. You know, often there weren't solid answers, you know. Um, I'll tell you, the Friday before Lehman Brothers went under, Lehman Brothers went under on a Sunday night. Um, that Friday, Everybody thought it was going to be saved. Not too many people thought there was going to be a Lehman bankruptcy uh, 48 hours, 72 hours later. Um, and that unpredictability, the, the, the range of possibilities that we were dealing with was, uh, you know, I, I could never have imagined. The morning I woke up on Tuesday, September 16th, something like that, if you had told me that by the time I went to bed, AIG would be 80% owned by the U.S. government, um, I, I would have, it seemed just unfathomable, seemed insane. Uh, but but there we were. Um, so it's it really is a remarkable period. It, it's it's a you know six week period that in American history is going to loom very large and and really just a transformative period for our history. And uh, you know the these these the policymakers are coming under a lot of criticism and there's been a lot of mistakes over this last year. But they did uh, patch things up and keep us from ending up with uh, you know we're 10 percent unemployment and not 20 or 25 and. Uh, so that's something. <laughs> and if you if you think about all the stories you read over that that stretch from Fannie Freddie weekend in early September until um, the the end of October, um, and you remember how many of them uh, you read and couldn't believe, just just imagine that for every one of those stories that we reported, there are five more that I had that turned out not to be true and are the, that's the a good great, point. The rumors the great, that were going around. Were the great benefit of having dozens of reporters out there 
talking to people, gathering information, is that you have your, your tentacles in many places. The drawback is you get information that uh, is, is really just rehashed rumors three or four times over. And sometimes they would come back to me, and I, I would be the person who three reporters uh, who cover Wall Street have determined something, and I'd be the person who has to go, that the Fed is going to do, and have to go and try to ferret this out. And um, <laughs> you know, when, when government agencies that are dealing with markets do not want to get into the business of, of, of basically taking every one of your, your facts and, and checking them, because then it becomes a really easy exercise of taking whatever you have to them, and they can tell you whether it's right or not, and then you go with it, and then everything gets out in the public. But you have to decide which ones are actually worth taking. And when you're in a period like that, there are a lot of things that sound pretty crazy that you start reconsidering, like um, a, an 80% ownership stake in the world's largest insurer. And once you're, you're feeling this out, you kind of start wondering what is fact and what isn't. But there were one re remarkably few stories during that crisis that were just blatantly wrong. Um, considering the amount of information that was going around. One recurring theme was, I swear, like once a week, uh, I had some some other reporter would hear something or there was some report in another publication that the Fed was about to bail out the auto industry. And <laughs> and and every single time, I, I, got, I, I wouldn't even make a call. I, I just knew that the Federal Reserve would do a lot of things, but they weren't going to bail out autos. But that didn't mean the TARP wouldn't, <laughs> the Treasury wouldn't bail out the auto industry. And uh, anyway, uh, but um, yeah, there were a lot of crazy rumors. They wouldn't turn GMAC into a bank holding company. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Did anybody have any other questions? I just I wanted to leave it on a light note. So I was curious to what was the most outlandish rumor that you heard during this time, <laughs> to leave it on sort of a lighter note. Let's see. It's such a blur. <laughs> Thing is, some of the, I mean, some of the crazy stuff, you know. Rumors that Morgan Stanley and Goldman Sachs were about to go under the week of the 14th. You know, uh, it didn't happen, but that doesn't mean it couldn't have happened. I mean, it, it, we avoided that fate, and they avoided that fate. But, um, but in a slightly different history of the world, that would have happened. Okay, any other questions? Um, I'd like to thank our panel. I know sometimes when we talk about financial uh, matters, it can be a, a bit soporific, I guess. <laughs> Your eyes can glaze over, but this was a very interesting, fascinating panel. So I'd like to thank David, Neil, Sudeep, and Edward for coming out. I know you can do a lot of different things on a Tuesday evening, so I really do appreciate you coming in and being with us. So thank you very much for a great panel. Thank you.